from your point of view as a CISO, do you believe what you see in the market, you know, when people promise is continuous, is it actually continuous? Um, or, or do you see a different reality? And then secondly, as you devise your strategy, how much of it do you see it to be continuous versus discrete and point in time? It's interesting, right? So uh, our tools 100% help, right? So they definitely help, right? So uh, for example, if somebody promises that they are going to have a continuous uh, uh, testing or continuous assessment of my infrastructure or my uh, ad access area with red teaming or a continuous uh, uh, basically like uh, penetration testing and continuous monitoring. So those tools are helpful in validating my controls. All right, so I do believe that they are they will play uh, basically a major part in actually validating my controls, right? Uh, at the same time, so uh, but that's not necessarily going to basically cover every aspect of your infrastructure or or your data or things like that, right? So that is a very important thing globally, uh, especially in India, where there's a lot of digitization that is happening. How do you see cybersecurity playing a key role in helping India retain its position as a leading digital economy? I would say uh, AI and machine learning are becoming very hot topics now. Do you see them having a big role in cybersecurity, making it ironclad for fintech companies in India? Yeah, I think uh, India has to uh, basically play a pivotal role uh, in uh, digital uh, transactions and uh, being a strong digital economy uh, in the world. So um, how does actually like uh, that uh, manifest itself is basically you can understand uh, that we are uh, the biggest um, uh, cashless uh, transaction in the form of UPI and things like that in India, which is a unique uh, basically accomplishment for India in terms of the infrastructure. How can CISOs get a seat at the table to influence security budgets of their company? So, I think uh, I have been fortunate uh, basically with uh, respect to uh, getting the necessary investments. Um, I, I do believe that like making sure that uh, our management the board is aware of um, the risk tolerance levels that we have and making sure that we need the necessary investment to ensure that we remain below that risk tolerance level. So it's very important to demonstrate the impact and demonstrate basically the um, uh, effect that uh, security breaches can have on an organization. Hello everyone, welcome to Cyber Sierra's Safe Tech Talk series. Today we have with us Hilal Ahmad Lone, who is a distinguished cybersecurity and artificial intelligence expert, currently serving as the Chief Information Security Officer at Razorpay. With over a decade of experience, Hilal has demonstrated exceptional leadership in shaping security strategies for prominent fintech platforms. In his pivotal role at Razorpay, he oversees security operations, ensuring the safety and privacy of millions of users utilizing the platform's online payment solutions. Hilal's expertise extends to his prior position as Senior Vice President of Security at Dream11, where he earned recognition for building and managing robust security teams. Hilal's certifications and skills include information security architecture, security testing, cloud security, web application security, and network security. His professional journey includes significant roles, such as Head of Information Security at Traveloka and Security Architect at Vera Security. It's a privilege to have you on our show today, Hilal. Are you ready for the first question? Sure. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, yes, let's, let's uh, go ahead. Let's get right into it. So, Hilal, what does your day look like? Um, so, to begin with, like it's full of meetings. My calendar is always packed. So, you get to meet a lot of stakeholders during the day. And... Um, uh, the typical day would uh, basically start with uh, uh, updating uh, basically whatever task that we're working on, any kind of uh, instance that we're responding, uh, meeting with my team, understand the progress on different projects, uh, meeting with different stakeholders uh, to understand uh, if they have anything um, that needs my attention, and uh, getting updated on the things around the industry, like, uh, and this, like fears that come in that I need to read. Uh, and then, uh, of course, like updating uh, whatever metrics that we are tracking. Uh, apart from that, uh, just so uh, basically like getting uh, to meet uh, my team and seeing if they have any blockers or any challenges and unblock them. And uh, apart from that, also there's like uh, some coaching and mentoring sessions that actually are planned as well because I manage a fairly large team. So uh, I have to set up those one on ones and basically get on with that. And then, of course, there are uh, like org wide 
um, based on the projects that are people being tracked and I need to be part of them as well. So um, the tracking that progress as well is also part, um, uh, part of my day job. So now, if you have to look at three aspects of cybersecurity, what are your top three priorities and why? Uh, I think uh, top three priorities uh, are basically making sure that uh, your organization has a, a well-informed and aware um, user base, uh, making sure that uh, uh, people are educated on cyber risk uh, and uh, giving them necessary tools and uh, necessary information to stay safe uh, while they're doing both professional or any kind of personal transactions uh, and digitally or when they're conducting themselves uh, on the internet and things like that. Making sure uh, that's actually one of the biggest priority to make sure that we do not fall uh, victims for phishing or something similar attacks, right? Uh, the second priority is obviously like making sure that we are always uh, basically aware of our security risk and risk tolerance. Uh, making sure that we are aware of basically the attack surface area that we are actually controlling. Uh, and making sure that we have visibility across our assets and that we need that need protection. Uh, apart from that, I think uh, uh, the priority, uh, the third priority is to ensure uh, that we have proper regulatory and compliance controls across the organization. Uh, we need to ensure that we have all the controls enforced and the governance maintained and uh, always making progress on those things and continuously improving uh, upon those security controls. So I think those are the three uh, areas of focus for us. For sharing this, Hilal, it's becoming a very important thing globally, uh, especially India, where there's a lot of digitization that is happening. How do you see cybersecurity playing a key role in helping India retain its position as a leading digital economy? I would say uh, AI and machine learning are becoming very hot topics now. Do you see them having a big role in cybersecurity, making it ironclad for fintech companies in India? Yeah, I think uh, India has to uh, basically play a pivotal role uh, in uh, digital uh, transactions and uh, being a strong digital economy uh, in the world. So um, how does actually like uh, that uh, manifest itself is basically you can understand uh, that we are uh, the biggest uh, uh, cashless uh, transaction in the form of UPI and things like that in India which is a unique uh, basically accomplishment for India in terms of the infrastructure accomplishments. And it's only going to grow from here, right? So we have not even penetrated the 30% of the user base. So the LLM and AI obviously is going to play a major uh, a role in uh, uh, basically like uh, accelerating uh, the programs uh, that are related to digital transactions and digital payment systems. And I think uh, we are poised for the leadership uh, role in this particular, not just because we have a, a tremendous uh, user base, but also because of the investment that is actually going into basically these areas and uh, the adoption, the rapid adoption of uh, the different uh, payment tools um, that's actually coming into existence. Uh, apart from that, I think uh, uh, the AI is basically like going to be naturally enabling these kind of uh, solutions because uh, if you want to basically like uh, accelerate and uh, basically build a resilient system and uh, go to market actually like quickly than anybody else, I think uh, AI will play a really pivotal role given the efficiency and uh, the faster turnaround time in terms of basically building up this, this infrastructure. So I think it's going to be uh, like uh, very interesting in the coming years to see like how it actually progresses in this area. But I do believe that it's going to play a very, very uh, important role in the overall acceleration and adoption uh, for digital payment systems, digital transactions, and overall the inter internet economy. Do you foresee, Hilal, that uh, staying ahead of attackers requires you to become a lot more complex in, a, in both an operational way and in your tech stack? Do you see this happening at Razorpay and, and other companies globally? Uh, I, I, I do believe that like uh, with the sophistication of uh, attacks, right? So it, it actually has got a lot to do with the complexity of the infrastructure and in the tech stack. right? But uh, what actually uh, uh, is more important is to understand that regardless of the complex complexity in the tech uh, stack, what the, the basic principles do not change. Uh, you need to maintain a strong uh, basic access control system. You need to have uh, data security by design or privacy by design. So these things are not going to change. If you are actually able to take care of these things at the design itself or by uh, basically integrating it to a development life cycles, I think it, uh, regardless of the complexity in the tech stack, it's still going to be uh, something that we have to do. Uh, apart from that, I think uh, some of those attacks that come as a part of this like uh, complexity in the tech stack, where uh, some unknown attacks happen and new attack vectors actually start originating. And there is possibility of 
basically like some unknown um, uh, technology bringing about changes in your environment that could result in pivoting of those attacks. So there's always potential for that. Uh, this obviously we don't disregard that. Uh, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, if you take care of the basic, the fundamentals that are necessary for you to safeguard your infrastructure, your applications, your users, your, I mean, all the security controls, if you have basically like uh, done in them in the right way, I think that, that should take care of the complexity of the tech stack. Um, it is always going to be like a different tech stack like uh, as we go, right? So we cannot always like build systems from scratch. So we have to evolve with it, right? So which means that like if we are able to basically like, ensure that the frameworks that we adopt actually are going to be resilient and they are going to evolve as the tech stack actually evolves, we should be okay. But at, at the same time, I also want to caution with the fact that we should not take these things uh, basically seriously because some of these attacks or some of these uh, vulnerabilities may not have known uh, basically uh, a remediation plan, right? So for organizers may not have those plans. So it's very important to basically make sure that you have the necessary precautions taken, like uh, backing up your uh, data, uh, like having uh, a disaster recovery sites and things like that, which will actually prevent all sorts of complex attacks that can be executed against the uh, tech stack that uh, uh, organizations actually have in place. Thank you for sharing this. I'm seeing a world where we have we are working on super intelligence with chat GPT, trying to bring it into a robotic body and make it work. Um, obviously, chat GPT and AI is in many, many systems, which are both used for attack and defense. And I'm also seeing where you have quantum computing, which is either already cracked but not widely distributed or is going to be cracked very soon, which means passwords can be brute force at scale. So, you know, when we combine these two, you have an environment where attacks can be at larger scale, more automated, more frequent. So naturally, organizations will have to move towards a defensive posture where, or they will have to invest in a defensive posture where it is continuous um, and always on. Do you, do you see that trend happening uh, on from your point of view as well? A hundred percent. I mean, uh, uh, as I said before, also that we have to evolve as the technologies and the pace of uh, innovation actually uh, increases, right? So quantum computing, for example, right? So nobody thought about basically a, um, a, 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 a SHA hash can be actually cracked like before like how it actually happens, right? Or an encryption can be actually like um, guessed correctly by quantum computing. So already that those things are happening, right? So uh, then apart from that, I think uh, the uh, ease at which people can actually build tools faster to attack an organization or gather information to attack an organization through chat GPTs or AI, for example, right? So those are always, uh, I mean, um, uh, this is a very se I mean, serious um, uh, uh, area of concern for most organizations because they need to build defenses according to that. So continuous monitoring and continuous security is always going to be a paramount. I think uh, if somebody is not doing that, I mean, it's, it's way past that. Right, so uh, it's very important that all organizations have a continuous uh, security and continuous monitoring in place uh, to ensure that, okay, they actually have a rapidly evolving uh, security defenses uh, with respect to evolving attacking uh, mindset as well. So in terms of basically the uh, uh, efficiency that attackers actually have now, because earlier we used to have um, basically people who used basically scanners and uh, basic, very basic tools uh, to attack an organization, uh, their impact was limited because we could still actually like guess what they are going to do and build defenses according to that. But because of the availability of sophisticated tools with AI, security chat, GPDs, and things like that, right? So now you can build advanced uh, security tools within seconds or within minutes, right? So that removes, that actually makes us like, uh, in, it's vulnerable all the time with 10 times the scale. So it's important that like um, those advanced tools that people actually have access to now uh, we need to build defenses according to that as well. Uh, so this uh, translates into us actually having a strategy, security strategy, and that actually takes consideration uh, uh, into uh, basically like the attacks that are actually toward today and how they are going to evolve. And it all comes down to basically like ensuring that there's a defensive posture that we have, which is tested and resilient, right? And you need to basically like validate it against the same tools that the attackers are going to use. And we, for example, the quantum encryption, encryption, for example, if it actually breaks uh, the encryption keys and things like that. So what is the next step? Uh, is multi-factor authentication going to be enough? Or is you know, basically authentication between applications with um, uh, more than like what quantum cryptography can actually break? Uh, can, is, is that going to be a mainstream thing? 
So we need to basically explore into these areas as well. And uh, whatever is like novel today, which is like uh, not mainstream, will become mainstream at some point of time. So it is important that we are prepared for that and basically build um, our uh, basically defensive strategy according to that as well. Can I double click into, into this defense uh, strategy that you speak about? How can you make it continuous? I see a, a whole set of tools coming in the market, which talk about continuous monitoring, continuous pen testing, continuous X, Y, and Z. Um, but from your point of view as a CISO, do you believe what you see in the market you know, when people promise it's continuous, is it actually continuous um, or, or do you see a different reality? And then secondly, as you devise your strategy, how much of it do you see it to be continuous versus discrete and point in time? Yeah, that, that's interesting, right? So uh, our tools 100% help, right? So they definitely help, right? So uh, for example, if somebody promises that they are going to have a continuous uh, uh, testing or continuous assessment of my infrastructure or my uh, at XFS area with red teaming or a continuous uh, uh, basically like uh, penetration testing and continuous monitoring. So those tools are helpful in validating my controls. All right. So I do believe that they are they will play uh, basically a major part in actually validating my controls. Right. Uh, at the same time, so uh, but that's not necessarily going to basically cover every aspect of your infrastructure or or your data or things like that. Right. So what happens is that. Um, you need to basically have a robust way of making sure that uh, your identities are secure. Uh, you need to basically have strategy in place that actually allows you to basically have complete visibility into your assets and the data that actually that's uh, basically present on them. Uh, you need to ensure, I mean, uh, we have to be able to basically like decipher um, basically like uh, real-time attacks uh, happening on an infrastructure and adopting technologies that will help us uh, detect them. So detection engineering uh, in real time is going to be really important. And I don't think the tools which are basically mostly um, offensive in nature are going to be able to basically do the detection engineering as well. Uh, because uh, the problem is that like uh, the red teaming that will happen on my infrastructure is as, only as good as the defenses that I have in place. And if my defenses are going to be like soft or they are not going to hold up against a sophisticated attack, it means that I will probably be already breached so in order for me to be able to basically like detect anomalies or, or detect any kind of unusual behavior in my infrastructure is going to be extremely important. And detecting that in real time obviously requires you to have a scale, um, a defense scale that actually like matches that speed. And um, not only that, I mean, you need to be able to basically get uh, actionable intelligence and actionable data uh, from your uh, detection and uh, prevention strategy so that people only act uh, when actually there's some uh, validated attack that's actually going on. So, and that also requires you to fine tune your defenses. And which means that it's going to be a whole 360 degree kind of like strategy to basically be able to do continuous monitoring and uh, continuous assessments of your infrastructure of your data. And uh, um, with respect to how tool, tools claim to basically be doing all of that, I, it only covers a portion of that. It does not cover the entirety of the uh, um, cyber kill chain or the attack kill chain. So it's going to be uh, interesting to see how these tools ever evolve over a period of time. But at this point of time, I would uh, strongly recommend uh, basically not just relying on the tools, but also making sure that you have enough detection capabilities, prevention capabilities, and uh, remediation capabilities in place, which continuously uh, need to uh, basically be evolving with the kind of the change in the environment but also have a very good incident response plan in place so that uh, you will be able to basically react or you will be able to prevent any kind of ongoing attacks as and when they come. So I think it's a combination of uh, tooling and combination of processes and combination of uh, uh, basically like your incident response that will actually get these things done. Thank you, Hila. This was um, comprehensive early, early response. I'd like to dig deeper into detection engineering that you were speaking about. Can you please shed, shed some light on this for, for our audience? Absolutely. I mean, uh, detection engineering is, I think, uh, one of the critical aspects of uh, our security operations. Right? So you need to be able to basically detect any kind of malware infraction or any kind of ongoing attack as early as possible. Right. So you need to contain them before they actually spread in an organization. And you need to have the right kind of tooling to do that. So all the tools that we have been using in the past or even using today, like uh, security incident and event management systems, uh, you use uh, end user behavioral analysis tools, you use anomaly detection tools, which are based on ML or something else, right? So they are, are going to be very important, but at the same time, you also want to make sure that your endpoint devices 
has the capabilities of detecting those infections or detecting those uh, anomalies as well. So your endpoint protection is going to be really important. So, uh, and on top of that, also it's important to understand what the privileges of the users are with respect to the actions that they take on systems that have critical infrastructure. So it, it's a combination of those things, right? So apart from that, I think detection engineering also is important with respect to building the tooling around that. So if the logging is not enabled or you don't have agents installed on your servers or you know, Kubernetes clusters or your microservices, so it's very important to basically have that visibility. So without visibility, you are going to be always in dark. So one of the important aspects of detecting, detection engineering is to have those tools send data to you. And you should be able to analyze uh, with the help of both the manual and automated analysis uh, to ensure that, okay, any attack that's actually being, being executed or any attack that is successful is contained. So I think uh, I would always uh, put uh, detection engineering on par with uh, like having an antivirus on a system, right? So because it's that important. And uh, the other uh, philosophy that I truly believe in is that uh, you should always be in an assumed breach kind of situation. So you should always assume that you are breached. Uh, so which means that the detection engineering becomes even more important. Right, so that uh, we want to make sure that even the unknown attacks are taken care of, the zero data attacks are taken care of. And that can only happen through sophisticated and well-built uh, detection engineering system now in the organization. Thank you for sharing this. We'd like to switch gears to ask about your views on India's data protection bill. Can you, can you share more? How do you feel about this bill? Do you think it's comprehensive enough? And how much of it are you applying in the organizations that you are building? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> So the data protection bill is most welcome. Uh, I wholeheartedly welcome, uh, basically, its uh, uh, implementation. Uh, the fact is that, like, uh, 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 one of the uh, biggest priorities for us is basically the data privacy and the data security of our customers. So that's the number one priority for us. We want to make sure that we have, uh, basically, we uh, make sure that we have all the controls that are necessary for us to protect and uh, the privacy as well as the security of the data. So I think this is something that actually makes us uh, uh, basically like com consolidate all of that. And uh, also it is, uh, I mean, a, a framework that allows us to build controls around that uh, requirement as well. Uh, in terms of basically like uh, uh, classifying the data, uh, the data fiduciaries and things like that, th those are the things that are actually very extremely important because it tells you the scope at which you need to operate to ensure the data privacy is maintained. And uh, because it actually ensures that the users have rights to the data, I think that's most welcome, right? So it also basically like ensures that people are not necessarily misusing the data uh, for which it has not been collected for. Like the purpose of the data was for a specific purpose and it needs to be only used for that purpose. So the misuse of the data will not happen and people have will have the right to basically like be forgotten or have their data deleted, which is very, very uh, uh, welcome in my opinion. Uh, in terms of its impact on us, like that's basically from and as a on, from personal point of view, I think that's most well. Uh, from a basically implementation point of view, so it does have uh, some uh, basically impact on the way we operate as well, right? So, for example, we need to build front end systems, we need to build uh, all the systems that actually make us compliant with uh, basically data in DPDPA, right? Uh, I think uh, that's a bit of work that we need to do, but uh, we are all fortunately for us that we already had those things, most of those things in place because. Uh, we uh, sort of like did an analysis on our systems and uh, wanted to basically ensure that we had the highest levels of privacy uh, controls in place. So we did an assessment uh, with international privacy laws like uh, GDPR uh, uh, earlier you know, last year and we year before that and uh, ensured that, okay, we had uh, baseline controls in place to ensure the data privacy. So, uh, but I, I'm, I'm assuming that that may not be the same situation for all the organizations. So a uh, lot of organizations will be in different stages of basically implementation of these controls. So I think uh, there's a bit of work that is involved and as and when the enforcement happens and the, as and when the rules of uh, basically engagement happen, I mean, are announced, I think that's when we'll actually get to know like what are the penalties. I mean, the penalties are already announced, <laughs> but it's more about basically how does it get enforced that's actually more important. So uh, in terms of us being compliant with that, I, uh, I'm, I think uh, uh, we are more or less there. Right. So in, in terms of we do a lot of activities internally to ensure that there is a very well uh, in, uh, data security and data privacy in place. So um, so I think uh, uh, we did not have a massive impact because uh, as a regulated entity, we already had other regulated bodies that required us to do that. 
and uh, and because this is like a number one priority for us, I think we were already prepared for it. So uh, we did our analysis early on, and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, it's uh, something that is going to be really important and really um, uh, welcome for uh, regulated entities like ours, particularly who do financial uh, transactions and who are involved in the financial domain. Thank you for sharing this. As you are approaching cybersecurity for a fintech, is there any specific uh, standards or frameworks that you keep in mind when you build your security strategy? Uh, absolutely, right? So uh, most of the time what happens is that like uh, uh, as a fintech, it's, uh, it's, the security posturing is not necessarily that different from any other tech company. Uh, we still have the same requirements, right? So we still have we need to basically comply with the same regulations and compliance uh, requirements. But what changes is basically the stringent and uh, basically like the uh, level of uh, security that we need to implement around data because we need to retain the data. We need to ensure the isolation of data. We need to ensure the uh, geographical fencing, geofencing of the data. So I think it changed a little bit. And uh, But uh, on the other hand, like most of the things, like for example, if we talk about CIS benchmarking, we talk about um, uh, uh, NIST, uh, RMF, and things like that, right? So all of those frameworks really help in actually like identifying any uh, black spots or any kind of blind spots for us in our infrastructure. Uh, but uh, we always use customized models, right? So we do not necessarily adopt all the things that CIS actually tells us, right? So it's always customizable for uh, cloud security. We have a reference architecture that we actually adopt to ensure that all the controls are in place. Uh, for application security, we have a DevSecOps kind of cycle where everything's actually like automated with respect to uh, security analysis and things like that. So uh, with respect to post-release, like penetration testing, security threat teaming, and things like that, those processes are already in place. So uh, for financial domains, I think the most uh, uh, impactful in terms of the security controls is actually retention uh, and controlling the data, access to the data, and that's actually very important. So which means that we have zero uh, basically flexibility in terms of determining the privileged access to data. So I think that's what changes. I, regarding the controls, I think controls are more or less the same, uh, but we do same, we do tend to basically like adopt uh, frameworks and then customize them uh, to basically enable us to basically like uh, modify that to suit the business needs that we have. And I think uh, that's how we actually do it. We don't actually necessarily have any um, uh, tool that actually like we use for basically like developing the framework. So it's more or less like internal things that we do to basically conform with any kind of external benchmarking that's in place. Okay, thank you. Would you say that most compliance frameworks are not really at, not really in tune for cloud adoption? Would you, in your experience, would you would you see that? Um, yeah, I think. Uh, 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 I think uh, if I understand your question correctly, it means that uh, other uh, frameworks are helpful in actually designing security strategy. Um, uh, I think they are, right? So I, uh, most of the security, it's, it's very uh, obvious that when we implement security, we implement with the inside out view or outside in view, right? So, uh, but in uh, what happens is that not everybody carries the same specialization. So there's always a tendency for us to basically overlook certain things, like because we did not have this, uh, uh, I mean, the skills that are necessary to identify the controls that are necessary to do that. And sometimes what happens is that uh, we may not have the infrastructure also in place that will actually allow us to basically build those controls. So what happened in this particular instance is that the frameworks actually help us do that. So it does, because it's so clearly uh, basically defined that uh, uh, there's a procedural way of doing things. So, for example, if you pick up any kind of a CS uh, control that we need to implement, it does not allow you to guess what exactly is needed. It, it actually prescribes what is actually needed. And I think that's very helpful because we may not possess all the skills necessary to build the uh, security strategy. So, uh, all the frameworks that uh, basically help us do that, I think uh, uh, NIST, uh, uh, CIS benchmark is really, really cool. Uh, I think uh, uh, NIST strategy is very cool. The CS, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I think the risk management framework is very nice. So all of those things like allow us to basically be, ensure that, okay, the controls are built uh, with the uh, uh, defense in depth in uh, basically like uh, in mind and all the necessary things that are going to be helpful for us. So um, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, um, in summary, I think uh, of the frameworks are really important for us to basically build a, a good security strategy that will actually like uh, be resistant uh, towards any kind of uh, obliviousness or any kind of blind, blind spots. 
Yes, thank you. And would this extend to cloud adoption as well? So absolutely. I think uh, one of the, I, as I was talking earlier about uh, reference architectures, right? So one of the, uh, we are a digital native company, so all our infrastructure is on um, uh, basically cloud. So we tend to basically look at the vendors, uh, uh, basically we are uh, determining what's a good security architecture that we can have. And uh, the, uh, they have really good documentation around, okay, what are the ways we can design accounts, we can design appliances, we can design services in a very, uh, by having security by design, right? So uh, when you actually like uh, have that flexibility from the vendor himself, like giving that uh, necessary tools that are required for us to implement policies um, and uh, for us to implement controls, I think it becomes very easy, right? So in terms of basically like adopting those uh, basically frameworks. And uh, I think if we follow those frameworks, uh, uh, basically the way it has been prescribed, uh, most of the things are actually getting accomplished by design. Uh, I'll give a simple example, right? So basically think about like AWS uh, uh, tooling itself. So you have like a lot of service that AWS offers. So you are never sure okay, what people are going to be using. Um, uh, so if people find something interesting, they will start actually using that at some point. So what happens in uh, basically AWS, they have some really cool services like uh, uh, control towers, like uh, service control policy, policies and things like that. Landing zones, for example. So if you implement those, right? So you will not, basically you will have security achieved by design meaning that you can implement an SCP policy uh, that will determine how people actually spin up infrastructure, new machines, uh, new users, uh, uh, new groups, uh, new networks, right? So you can actually define that at the very top. So all those basically will be filtered, the controls, the necessary uh, governance framework will be filtered across the service and the applications, which means that if you adopt that framework properly, so you will potentially not be worried about uh, if somebody is going to basically expose an S3 bucket or if somebody is going to basically uh, expose the network or if somebody is going to be uh, like having access privileges, for example, or uh, if somebody has done some misconfiguration in any of the services that they use. So you can get rid of them. You can actually like eliminate them if you design your service control policy properly. So I think uh, the, those frameworks are really, really helpful. So the, all the reference architecture that I was talking about earlier is actually a byproduct. Of that. So meaning that like we can have these frameworks actually applied to the cloud security um, uh, with relative a lot of uh, ease with respect to application security. Thank you for sharing this. In your point of view for Indian fintechs, how do you feel about maturity in terms of security and compliance? It would be unfair of me to comment on other fintechs, right? So I believe that as, as an industry, like um, we are um, uh, basically like, uh, doing a lot in terms of basically like, uh, maintaining the user trust and building a robust infrastructure. And that's actually reflected uh, in the kind of resilience that uh, the fintechs have shown with respect to massive amounts of attacks that are executed on uh, their infrastructure on a daily basis. And so I, I see all my uh, basically other fintech peers actually doing similar kind of things, which means that they are taking security really, really seriously. They are taking compliance very, very seriously. So as an industry, we are actually like uh, uh, taking uh, these things uh, uh, with the uh, importance that it actually deserves. And uh, the laws like uh, regulations and the laws and the compliance things that we actually have to adopt actually only make it more uh, basically relevant for us to basically implement uh, uh, like robust security. So the FinTech as an industry is actually like uh, uh, getting there. They're maturing in terms of security and privacy. There are obviously like rooms for improvement for everybody in the FinTech. Uh, but I think we are getting there. Like we are getting the uh, basics right. Uh, and uh, think about it, right? So for example, the uh, distribution, uh, I mean, uh, DDoS attacks that are executed against our infrastructure, right? Massive, right? So, but we do not actually hear a lot about services going down, right? So they're uh, like, we have never, I mean, uh, I have not uh, basically read anywhere uh, in the last uh, month or so that some, some services have gone down just because of the DDoS, right? So which means that people are doing the right kind of things that design their infrastructure in the right way. And we are evolving as an industry with respect to security and compliance controls. Um, and uh, I do believe that this is not optional, all right? Uh, so we need to basically like make sure that we retain the trust of the users, retain the trust of the investors, to retain the trust of uh, basically the uh, employees. So it's very important for us to take this as seriously as we can. Okay, thank you. Are you worried about third party risk? Is Do you, do you have concerns that you know, you have spent so much time and energy building the fortress at Razorpay um, or the company that you're building. And 
yet you might get breached because somebody which is a consultant or a software vendor that's working within your premises uh, may get hacked and therefore the data of customers of Razorpay may get impacted. Is that something that concerns you? Well, absolutely. Right. So I think uh, most of the successful data breach that have happened in the recent past, right, so have happened because of a third party, um, like uh, uh, basically negligence, and sometimes it happens because of supply chain attacks uh, that are very common. I think the solid winds attack or even before the XFM attack or a lot of the attacks that have happened have happened to basically like uh, supply chains, right? So um, I think uh, one of the core areas of, of focus for us is basically vendor uh, risk management. Uh, and um, what we do is basically we make sure that all the uh, supply chains are basically secured. Uh, we are we have uh, reviews done on the suppliers, the users, the contractors, and everybody, right, uh, on a very very regular basis. So meaning that like this is a uh, uh, this is potentially one area where uh, attacks can get successful because we may lose visibility on how people are using the privilege, how the software is being designed and developed and deployed. And if there's a missing patch in the software, uh, I mean, vendor supplied software, like, so there could be a lot of reasons uh, through which we can actually get impacted. So it's very important to have controls around that. And we are very, very serious about that. And uh, vendor risk management is not only basically a serious security control, but it's also uh, equally important in the compliance world as well. Um, because we need to demonstrate that we have uh, not only visibility, but also control over the actions that our vendors or the uh, open source software or a sub vendor supply software can actually like, have on our infrastructure and our data. So um, and this is a very serious area and uh, we uh, obviously take it extremely seriously. And uh, we vet all the vendors that are there. We vet all the contractors that are there. We do background checks on all the vendors. And we do all kinds of necessary things that are important for us to basically make sure that uh, we are not impacted by supply chains. But it's obviously one area uh, which is always going to be uh, like a serious concern, and uh, we give it the necessary importance that's actually uh, required by cyber supply chain uh, vulnerability things like. That. Okay, thank you for sharing this. How can CISOs get a seat at the table to influence security budgets of their companies? Yeah, this is a <laughs> this is a painful question. Right. So, um, so I think uh, uh, I have been fortunate, uh, basically, with uh, respect to uh, getting the necessary investments. Um, I, I do believe that, like, making sure that uh, our management, the board, is aware of um, the risk tolerance levels that we have, and making sure that we need the necessary investment uh, to ensure that we remain below that risk tolerance level. So, it's very important to demonstrate the impact and uh, demonstrate, basically, the um, uh, effect that uh, security breaches can have on an organization and how does it actually manifest itself in terms of the business uh, uh, functioning properly. So uh, giving them that uh, value, giving them that information about um, the business impact that it can have if we, are, if we do not invest properly in security is really, very important. And we have to justify it with the data that we actually collect through uh, different analytic systems that we have in place, like how many breaches we actually foiled successfully how many attacks we have on a daily basis, like how does it actually um, sort of translate into uh, the monetary and non-monetary loss that the company will have. So doing all the uh, risk uh, exercises uh, to understand uh, or quantify the security risks that we have is extremely important uh, to demonstrate this, the value of the cybersecurity as a whole, as a program. So if you are able to successfully like uh, demonstrate that, okay, we need investments or we need uh, basically like uh, infrastructure uh, to build a basically robust security program. So it's uh, that's how it actually works. So to basically like translate that into the business impact. Um, and uh, sometimes like what happens is that uh, it's also important uh, to ensure that, okay, whatever investment that we require uh, is actually like translated into uh, basically progress over a period of time. So we need to have those data available with us to ensure that we are actually maturing from going from zero to one, one to two, and on and so on. And we have to demonstrate that. It cannot be after we get investment just because uh, somebody's trying to attack us. It cannot actually work like that. You need to be able to basically ensure that, okay, that attack, if that attack is successful, what's going to happen next? Uh, you will have reputation damage, you have a financial damage, your insurance cost that's going to go up. And uh, so all of those things, if we actually like properly explain and properly define that, I think uh, getting the investment is not going to be a problem. Um, but at the same time, you also want to make sure that you are seen as a enabler for the business 
rather than actually like a cost center that actually uh, is going to be like like a necessary evil. So it should not be seen like that. You should be seen as a business enabler rather than something else. Thank you for sharing this. As Razorpay, would you say cybersecurity challenges are you there are unique challenges that you see in cybersecurity as a payments company, or would you say that the challenges that you are facing are the same as what other fintechs and banks are facing? Yeah, it's the same thing, right? So basically, I don't believe that uh, a fintech actually has. Uh, uh, we can always talk about basically like having uh, a persistent attacks or somebody trying to basically sabotage your systems and things like that to gain some um, advantage and things like that, or nation state actors basically trying to basically disrupt our business because they want to hurt India economy or something like that. So we can always talk about that, but. Uh, what happens is that at the end of the day, like what other fintechs are basically like uh, facing, like we face the same thing. Um, uh, given that uh, we are a little bit more prominent, we have a, like a bit of a leadership position in this space. So we obviously get a bit more share of our attacks. Um, uh, but that's only because uh, it, it does not necessarily change the way we look at them. So we still need to basically like have a uh, strategy and have a, a really good objective in terms of basically like mitigating those risks. So I think uh, uh, Razorpay does not necessarily have any unique um, basically like that are specific to Razorpay attack because our tech stack is like, um, uh, uh, the technology that we use may be different, but the tech stack is like similar to other fintechs. Uh, so it, it, so most of the attacks that are executed against us will be executed against other fintechs as well. And so uh, and, uh, and on the other hand, like I think we move a lot of money all right, so the disruption of business is always going to be there. So we actually put a lot of focus on that. The availability becomes like very important. The confidentiality becomes very important for us. So I think uh, uh, mitigating those kind of risks are also very important. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, like it's this, uh, I mean, the attacks are going to be similar to what other uh, fintechs are actually facing. Thank you very much, Hilal. This brings us to our last question for this enlightening conversation. Thank you so much for sharing. One last question I have for you is, for this year, what trends are you seeing in cybersecurity? Um, I, I, I do believe that like uh, our continuous monitoring and continuous security, things like that are going to be extremely important. And people are going to move away from uh, basically like, uh, just the parameter security or endpoint security. Uh, people are going to basically like focus a lot more, more on basically gaining insights and analytics from the data that actually they capture. So there's going to be a lot of focus on uh, basically like AI, obviously, like I don't like uh, it became such a big word. So everybody's focusing on that. So I think that will also influence the decision that people are going to make. Um, using the data properly uh, is uh, going to be important. And the regulatory um, challenges that are going to happen, that's also going to basically influence the security strategy and the compliance strategy of an organization. Uh, apart from that, I think uh, um, uh, cloud security uh, is going to be important as well. Um, in terms of uh, basically like the user uh, security, that's always going to be important. It will continue to have that uh, importance as well. Um, uh, what is uh, going to be uh, not so uh, like uh, cool basically going forward, I believe, um, is uh, some some traditional controls will go away. Like, for example, uh, people tend to tend to use a lot of security code reviews to understand the code manually and things like that. Like I think some of those activities are not going to be as prominent because people move to basically autonomous or auto automatic uh, controls, right? So rather than focusing on uh, manual efforts that actually they put in the uh, security tasks. So I think that's going to be uh, something that we may not see as much, but uh, automation and uh, desktops and uh, things like that are going to be prominent. Um, yeah, so that's what I think is going to happen in uh, 2024. Thank you so much for sharing your time and precious insights with us, Hilal. Really enjoyed speaking to you. Thank you. Yeah, same here. It was a pleasure talking to you and uh, uh, it was very, very uh, good conversation. I, I, I don't believe that I had a better conversation with one of you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah.